So welcome to the second chapter of my half of the compilers course and my objective today is to introduce syntax analysis and um, actually along the way I'm going to show you a complete compiler. So this course is about compilers and I'm going to kick off by showing you a whole compiler from beginning to end and in the end I'm going to show you all the source code for this compiler on one slide. So um, we're going to do it using Haskell. Haskell is going to help us keep things really, really short. If you haven't seen Haskell before, don't worry, it's not that scary. Um, and if you do find things are hard to understand, don't hesitate to, to ask um, in Piazza or in, in one of our interactive classes. Um, <coughs> so what we're going to do in this lecture is introduce grammars and parsing, also known as syntax analysis. The um, abstract syntax tree, a simple instruction set for a simple computer that we're going to generate code for. We're going to choose a computer so simple that real machines don't quite exist that are as simple as that. But we'll come to more realistic machines in a, a very few, very, very short time. I'll show you the code generator and we'll do the lexical analysis as well. So um, compare incidentally this with the way that the topic is introduced in the standard textbooks and they all begin with a chapter um, that basically does the same thing, walks you through the complete end-to-end -end design of, a of the simplest imaginable compiler. And where we're going with this is to actually produce Haskell code. And you can go and find the code on the web. I'll show you it as we go along. So as we discussed in the first lecture, um, a compiler takes as input source language code. The first thing it does is lexical analysis, sometimes called scanning, to break the input characters into lexical tokens. So to distinguish keywords and identifiers and punctuation symbols of various kinds that are significant in the language um, grammar. The syntax analysis is where we use that grammar to discover the syntactical structure, the grammatical structure, the nesting structure of the program. And all of this is the, is the analysis side of our compiler. The next thing to do is to walk the resulting abstract syntax tree, because that's what this, this phase is going to produce. We're going to walk that tree and generate code. And that will give us, as output, the machines for our very, very simplified computer architecture. The instructions for our very simple our computer architecture. So in order to keep it simple, I'm going to do it in Haskell. Um, so here's the compiler in three lines of code. Um, obviously, I have to tell you what there is. Um, I have to provide definitions for these things. So a compiler takes as input a list of characters, perhaps from a file, and it produces a list of instructions, of assembly language instructions. And of course, what we're going to do is print those and put them into a assembly code file and use an assembler to turn them into machine code instructions. Um, we could cover all that in more detail as well. For the simplicity in this course, we're going to talk about compilers that generate assembly code, assembly code, human readable assembly code as their output. Um, the step beyond from assembly code to machine code is pretty straightforward and I think some of, many of you will have seen it before. So what does the compiler do? It takes program, character string, list of characters, and it applies the scanner, the lexical analysis, to produce the list of tokens. Then it applies the parser to turn that list of tokens into the abstract syntax tree. And then the translator is going to walk that tree and generate the list of output instructions. So incidentally, um, I'm going to introduce syntax analysis. Um, syntax is part of the specification for a programming language. It tells you what the legal programs are in some sense. It tells you about the grammar 
of the language. But it doesn't tell you anything about what the program means, nor does it tell you anything about semantic properties, like agreement properties, like that you use a variable in the same way as that you declare it. Um, those properties need to be checked separately. And there's been a huge amount of work historically on building tools to help you construct compilers. Tools to help you with syntax analysis are very well developed and really, really work and really, really help and are positively recommended as um, a, 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 a way to, a, as a component part of a compiler project. You don't have to use them and you can find people on the web who will tell you that it's better to do it yourself. Um, I'll show you how to do it yourself and you be the judge. Semantics, well, although there's been a huge amount of research on automatic compiler generation tools where you specify the semantics of your programming language and the compiler just figures it out, um, those tools are not really working to a usable extent. There are certainly many compiler tools that are helpful. Um, so one of them, for example, is instruction selection, where you try and decide which instructions from your instruction set are appropriate at a particular point. I think I mentioned this in the last lecture. And there are other tools that you find in compilers. But the general idea that you specify the semantics and the compiler just look and the compiler 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 just looks after it hasn't quite taken off. So I'm mentioning this to talk about what does work. And what does work is parser generators. And Naranka will tell you how they work and how to use one. So um, grammar, the grammar of a program, the syntax of a program, is defined using a language that looks a bit like this. And this goes by the name of Bacchus Nauer form, or BNF. Um, it's a context-free grammar. Um, let me show you an example. So imagine a programming language and we're specifying lots of different parts of the programming language, but let's look at the specification for what is a valid statement. And there may be many different kinds of valid statement in your program, but this is where we define what an if statement looks like. So in this language, the grammar says that an if statement consists of an if token, spelt if, presumably, a bracket, and some expression, a closing bracket, and then a statement, then the else token, and then another statement. Presumably this is the then branch, and this is the else branch. So each of these productions, and we may have other productions to talk about other statements in the language, perhaps for loops or something, each production, this thing is a production, shows one valid way by which a non-terminal can be expanded into a string of terminals and non-terminals. What do I mean? Well, this is the non-terminal on the left-hand side. And on the right, we get a mixture, we get a sequence of terminal, terminal, non-terminal, terminal, non-terminal, non and so on. The non-terminals are going to be defined in subsequent other productions. The terminals are things that actually appear in input programs. So incidentally, I mentioned that this um, notation, this BNF thing, is a context-free grammar. What I mean by that is that the left-hand side is always just a simple non-terminal. If um, the left-hand side could be something more complicated, then you would have a context-sensitive grammar. And context-sensitive grammars are enormously more powerful and enormously less useful for, for specifying programming languages. They're much harder to understand what they actually mean. OK, so in this example, we have some terminals and some non-terminals. And the terminals are the things that can appear in the final result. The non-terminals, well, what we're going to do is apply productions again and again and again until we've got rid of all the non-terminals. So um, 
Here's our example again. Suppose that the actual input to your compiler contains something that looks like this. So you're in a context where you're expecting a statement and what you get is this. So you can check that the if matches the production, right? This tells you that it's probably an if statement, right? You can check that the bracket is there. All good so far. Then you get to some stuff. Now, the stuff could be any sequence of instruction, of, 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 of characters or lexical tokens or anything. And what we have to do is to check that whatever it is, is an expression. It's a valid expression. And when we get to the end of it, we need to check that there's a close brackets here, right? And that actually means that we have to be a little bit careful because this expression, you know, could be any expression. It could be a complicated expression. It might even include more round brackets, more opening and closing round brackets. And we need to make sure that whatever this stuff is, it's a whole expression with balanced brackets so that when we get to this bracket, we know that it corresponds to that bracket. Then we expect a statement and we're going to go and look up what the valid statements are and we need to elaborate or we need to check that, um, that whatever we find here is consistent with one of the productions for stats, for statements in our language, and then an else, and then another one. So basically, you look at this input, and it looks like it's been constructed correctly according to the production. And the job of the parser, the job of the syntax analysis, is to prove that it is, in fact, grammatically correct, and that the input that you've got is consistent with the grammar that you've, you're, you're working with. So um, what we have to do to do that is we have to show that stuff one can be derived using the grammar's rules from the exp, from the exp non-terminal, and similarly for stuff two and stuff three with stat. So that's a little bit abstract. Let's get completely concrete with a completely simple example. So a context-free grammar is a mathematical object. It consists of four components, a start symbol, a non-terminal, a set of productions like the stats production, a set of tokens like if and bracket and so on, and a set of non-terminals like stat and exp one of which is the start symbol. So here's the little example. This example has two non-terminals, bin and dig. And um, for bin, we have two production. For, for bin, we have three productions. For dig, we have two productions. Um, the start symbol, let's suppose that the start symbol is bin, right? So can you see? Can you see what um, what would be a valid program in this programming language? So it could be. So let's start with this. What could be the shortest possible program in this language? Well, the shortest possible program. We start with bin. This looks long. This looks long. This looks short. So let's pick that one. And then we can pick one of these, and they're both short. So the shortest possible program could be a zero or a one. Um, they're both, both, both as short as can be. Longer examples come from choosing different choices here, right? And if we do it right, we get a sequence of ones and zeros separated by pluses and minuses. So the Terminals in this language are plus, minus, zero, one. The nom terminals are bin and dig. The start symbol is spin. And there's this notion of derivation. Strings of terminals can be derived using the grammar by starting with the start symbol and repeatedly replacing each non-terminal with the corresponding right-hand side. 
So a, the point of the, this definition of deriving is that when you've derived a sequence that consists only of terminals, then you can't do any more deriving, and you've got what is called a, a sentence in this language. A sentence in the language because the language of the grammar is the set of all the sentences that you could possibly get. Right? So if we look at our example back here, um, we said that the sequence zero is in the language. It's a sentence in the language, um, and it's a short one. The sequence one is another one, and there are more, right? In fact, because of this recursion here, there are many more, right? There are infinitely many sentences in this language. So um, can we characterize, can you tell me what the language is? We can look at some examples. Let's look at this example. So um, what I did was I started with the non-terminal and I used the grammar. Here's the grammar again for your convenience. I used the grammar to go from here to here, right? So if you look, this is the left-hand side of this production. And this is the right-hand side of that production. So each of these steps here corresponds to a use of one of the productions in the grammar in a left to right way. So we can start with the start symbol. We can choose one of these. Let's choose that one. We get to this. Then we can choose what to do with this one. Let's choose the first production. Then we can choose what to do with this one. Let's choose this last production. So now we have a terminal here. We can't go any further down this branch. This is a terminal as well. This one is a digit. We can choose either that production or that production. Let's choose the one. Um, minus and then digit and let's choose the zero there. Okay, so this is how to use the grammar to generate arbitrary, to generate sentences in this language. And the reason I'm laboring this point is that this diagram tells you, it's a proof that this particular sequence is in the language. Right? You can check this proof. You can check that each of the steps, here's one, here's another, here's another, each of the um, derivations from a non-terminal to a terminal or to, to sequence of terminal, a sequence of, of terminals and non-terminals. Each one, you can check that it corresponds to a, to, to a, to a um, use of one of the productions in the grammar. So the parse tree is this pictorial proof that the string was properly derived from the start symbol. And what's nice about parse trees is that although they may be a little tricky to find, they're very easy to check. This is a really nice property in a kind of theorem-proving context that um, once you've found the proof, then checking that it is in fact a correct proof is very easy. It's not always true. There are problems where um, checking a proof is, is, is a, co a computationally hard thing to do. But in this case, um, proving that a sentence is in a grammar by checking the parse tree is a very efficient and quick thing to do. So that's the parse tree. And what I wanted to emphasize is that it's a kind of mathematical object. It's a proof. It's a diagrammatic proof. And parsing or syntax analysis, the job that we have to do in the compiler in order to understand the programming language, is basically the process of finding this proof. It's the process of finding the choices of productions that in fact produce the sequence of terminals that the programmer wrote. And if you can't, 
It's because you found a syntax error, presumably. So um, here are some examples. I claim that the language of my little grammar G contains a one, and here's my proof. I hope you agree with me. Here's another, and so on, right? And these can get complicated, but the proof checking is simple. Normally, when we're trying to prove something, it's okay if there's more than one way to prove it. Um, however, in this particular case, it might actually be a problem that there's more than one way to prove something. So consider this grammar. The first grammar I chose was carefully chosen to not have this ambiguity problem. But this grammar, grammar um, I hope you agree with me that it's a reasonable grammar, right? This, this string is in this language, right? So it's a reasonable grammar, you might think, for expressions of this kind. But, perhaps you can see why, there's trouble. Because this string has two different parse trees, and they're both correct. They're both checkable. Here's one, and here's the other. So what we did was we, here's our grammar again, we can either choose to elaborate the left operand, the left operand of this plus, or, or, or as we've shown in this example, actually, right? This is where we expand the left one first. And this is the one where we expand the right one first. But the sequence of terminals, 9 plus a minus 2, is exactly the same, 9 plus a minus 2. So there are two different parse trees. This claim that this is in the language is super true. Unfortunately, the, sh the shape of the parse tree is quite important to us in understanding what the program actually means. In, in particular, it might make a difference to how you interpret this expression. So we have to fix that. And this is where we need to think about what it was we actually wanted, right? Did we want to interpret 2 minus 3 minus 4 with this bracketing or that bracketing? Do we, want it, do we want to treat the minus operator as left associative or right associative? That choice is... It's actually a matter for the language designer, right? You may have a mathematical intuition or a sense of good taste that tells you which of these is right. But as a language designer, you can choose which one you like. And for minus, it might be reasonably obvious which one you might like. But, um, and the left associative looks like a good idea. There are examples where right associative is a good idea. Um, this is a nice simple one, lists in Haskell. So what you want is this colon operator um, is the cons operator. It attaches a element of a list to a list. So the right-hand operand is supposed to be a list. This empty list, we attach a 3 to that, a 2 to that, and a 1 to that. We need colon to be right-associative. Um, perhaps you know of other examples of operators that, um, that should be right-associative. You might like to think about that and uh, see if you can suggest one in the, in the tutorial class. There's another consideration, and I imagine many of you have thought about this too. Uh, suppose we have an expression like 9 plus 5 times 2. Um, if, so we could require the programmer to make explicit use of brackets to express what they mean here. We could just say that plus and times are always left associative or something. What we actually want is precedence. We want the times operator to bind more tightly than the plus. So we want, when we write this, we want to get that. But when we write this, we want to get that, right? That's what binding more tightly means. And we may well have other operators with other precedence and associativity properties. And there could be higher levels of precedence, right? You might have exponentiation having higher precedence than, than multiplication, for example. 
So um, what I'm doing here is I've introduced the idea of a context-free grammar, of the, of the Bacchus Nauer form of, of syntax checking, of building the parse tree. I've suggested that we're going to do parsing in order to understand the structure of the compiler's input. And what we can now talk about is designing the grammar of the language to meet our requirements, to give us the meaning that we intend for the programs that the programmer writes. So um, in order to represent this precedence concept, what we could do is this. We could structure the grammar level by level, right? So there's a level at which um, you can think of your expression as a sequence of terms separated by low precedence operators, right? And then inside each term, we have a sequence of things that are separated by high precedence operators. So that leads us to a grammar with two levels, right? So we have this part of the grammar that talks about an expression as a sequence of terms separated by plus and minus. And then this part of the grammar talks about terms as sequences of factors separated by times and divide. Right, so this is a layered structure. And if we wanted to have an additional level of precedence, perhaps for exponentiation or something, we could just add another layer here. Okay, so now if we look at an example like this one, can we, do, does it do what we want? Well, I claim that it does. Um, so what happens is that the plus operator um, so we expect an expression here, a plus a term, and um, then the right-hand side is going to be a term which expands to a sequence of factors, a, a pair of two factors separated by times. Okay, and I claim, and you might like to check my claim, that this grammar is unambiguous that there is no other parse tree for this example, and in fact that there are no examples for which there's more than one parse tree. Um, so incidentally, um, the parse tree um, is a mathematical object. It's a proof about the validity of the sentence. It's a proof that the sentence is in the language of the grammar. Um, the parse tree I mean, we kind of have to work with the parse tree in the sense that this is, this is how our syntax analyzer is going to have to work. But we don't have to actually build the parse tree. And you can see from this example that this, this is quite complicated. On the right here, we have a simpler representation that captures everything that you could reasonably want to know about this expression. This is called the abstract syntax tree. So the point is that you might use the parse tree to check that the input is valid, but the tree you actually construct is simpler, is the AST. And this is the tree that we're going to pass further into the compiler in order to do, for example, code generation. Okay. So now I should show you how to build a parser. And um, I hope you've already kind of done it yourself. Um, <clears throat> so there are basically two general classes of parsing algorithms. There's top-down and bottom-up. Top-down is sometimes called predictive, and you'll see why in a moment. Um, in fact, top-down parsers, the simplest easiest, most intuitive way to build a parser is using this recursive descent strategy, which I'm going to tell you about in a moment. Um, the alternative, the bottom-up approach, 
is a little bit more complicated in my view. Um, it is actually attractive for various reasons. It handles a slightly larger class of grammars than top-down parsers do. Um, so Naranka will show you how top-down, but how bottom-up parsers. I'll, I'll show you how they how they work. Naranka will show you how to build one. So let's illustrate both top-down and bottom-up with the same example, and here it is. So you might like to take a moment to see if you understand what this grammar does, what it means. So do you agree with me that this input is syntactically valid according to this grammar? Right, so it begins with S, you can see, right? Um, this grammar is recursive in stat list. So top-down parsing begins with this slogan. Start with the start symbol. Makes sense. And search for a rule that rewrites the non-terminals to yield inputs, to yield terminals that are consistent with the input. And the important thing is that we're going to do this left to right, right? So we're not going to repeatedly scan and skim the um, sequence here. We're going to look at the first symbol and see if looking at just that first symbol, we know what to do. So do you know what to do? Um, it begins with begin, right? So look at these, these productions. This is the start symbol. It's either this one or this one, but it can't be that one because that one has to begin with an S. It must be this one. So now we know what comes next. What we're expecting is a stat list, okay? So the challenge here is to do this by only looking at one symbol at a time. And the objective is to be able to take each step where we decide what to do and therefore which parse tree we're going to find without ever having to look at a token more than once or twice. What we really mustn't do is uh, any kind of backtracking, right? We don't want to proceed all the way to the end to here and then discover that this isn't consistent with the choices that we took, right? What we want to do is to make the correct choice at each step. And what I'm going to show you is how. So here's a walkthrough of um, the, um, the top-down parsing using the grammar we were just looking at. So we start with the, non, with the start symbol, as I told you, and we start with all of the input. And the first thing we do is we look at the first symbol of the input and we look at the non-term, we look at the productions that are available to us and see whether or not one of those productions is consistent with the input that we have, right? So one of the productions does indeed begin with, begin with the word begin. So let's pick that one. So if that was the correct thing to do, then the next thing that we're expecting is a stat list. And the next token that we should look at is this S, right? Now, um, the grammar doesn't have a rule for stat list that begins with um, S. It's got a rule for stat list that begins with begin, and it has a rule for stat list that begins with stat. So let's just assume that that must be the right one and choose that production and expand to this um, right hand, with, with this right hand side. So now we're looking at this, symbol, this input symbol still, but we're expecting a stat. And that's lucky because the stat non-terminal does have an S production, a production that begins with S. So once we've matched that, we can check that what comes next is what we're expecting, a semicolon, and we are 
here we're looking at this next symbol and we're expecting a stat list so the same thing is going to happen again um, we choose this production we check that the input does match a stat and it does we check the semicolon is present and then we get to this non-terminal and this point in the input and at that point we choose the other production for stat list right the two productions for stat list one begins with begin the other begins with end and this must be the right one and we're done we've ticked off all of the input and we've constructed a complete parse tree or complete um, proof that this was in fact a sentence in the language of our, of our grammar okay so that is top-down parsing predictive parsing and the thing to observe is that when we look at the grammar we use the grammar in a left to right fashion we expand non-terminals to um, right hand sides so that's top-down parsing and um, the thing to verify is that when we take a step we really are sure that it must be the right step just to give you an example of what could go wrong um, there's a step isn't there when we're looking at the symbol s but we don't have a production that begins with s we have a production that begins with begin and we have a production that begins with stat so we know that the begin pathway was wrong so the stat must be right even though we don't actually have positive reassurance that it's right yet but we know that we will and when you construct a parser a top-down parser you have to check that those inferences are in fact going to be correct so incidentally i mean things could go wrong right um just look at this little example this is a simple problem that you can solve um suppose that our grammar has two different productions that begin the same way right so we can't tell by looking at the first symbol whether we should choose this production or that production well i think you can see how to fix this because basically we just delay making a decision until this point right what you can actually do is modify the grammar to represent that idea right so we can modify this grammar to factor it out to so we have loop stat list and then stat two either begins with until or forever depending upon which production you take so we can avoid this problem with constructing our top-down parser by modifying the grammar in a simple way as i hope you might see as we go forward whilst this problem was easy to solve not all of the problems can be as easy to cure as this one let me show you instead bottom-up parsing sometimes called shift reduce parsers and um, as i mentioned to you most of the automatic parser generators use bottom-up parsing um, because it handles a slightly larger grammar larger family of grammars so um, bottom-up parsing um, uses the productions from right to left top down was using was going from the left the non-terminal to the right the right hand side the sequence what we're going to do with bottom up parsing is we're going to try and pattern match things on the right hand side and collapse them to non-terminals on the left hand side and if we can collapse the entire input back to the start symbol then we're done so here's my walkthrough with our grammar again of um, bottom-up parsing so um, we start with an empty stack and we'll see what the stack is for in a second and we start with an input sequence and this is the current symbol that we're looking at 
And at each step, we're going to make a decision. We're going to take an action. So the first step, we look at this symbol and we ask, is this the right hand side of, or can we, do we have here the right hand side of one of our productions? And the answer is, well, no, we've got the beginning of one, but we haven't got a whole one. So what we do is we take a shift action. We shift this symbol onto the stack. Now we're looking at S. Now S is the right hand side of this stack production. So we can take a reduce action using rule A. So we reduce S to stat, right? So we're using this production in a right to left fashion. Whoops, excuse me. Um, we're using this production We're using this um, production in a right to left fashion. And we update the representation of our input symbol here with that non-terminal. So now we're looking at um, the net, this symbol and it's the stat by its well, begin stat is not the right hand side of any of our productions. So um, we shift the semicolon, we shift the S. We do the same thing with S, we replace it with stat, as we did before. We shift the semicolon, and now we get to the interesting bit because we found end. Now end is the entire right-hand side of the stat list production. So we do a reduce action using rule B this time. So that takes us to stat list. And now we can see that on the stack we have something that does match the entire right hand side of a production. Stat semicolon stat list. There it is, stat semicolon stat list. So we do a reduce step using rule B and we can do it again, right? And then we get begin stat list and that's over here. That's a reduce rule A. And here's stat, the, non the start symbol. So we have achieved what we set out to do. We've managed to um, to um, pattern match the the input sequence, and by successively rewriting from right to left, we've managed to collapse the entire input sequence down to the start symbol. So we've succeeded. <coughs> And what I haven't shown you along the way is that we could have constructed the parse tree to do it. Um, you could also just check the sequence to see that each time we did a reduce step, um, it was a correct one, right? That it, it was a correct use of the grammar. Okay, now the art of bottom-up parsing is to do this pattern matching without having to search. And that is something that Naranka will show you how to do. Okay, so bottom-up parsers, they're a little bit tricky to construct by hand. In contrast, as I'll show you in a minute, top-down parsers are really easy to construct by hand. However, they handle some things that top-down parsers can't, um, and consequently, they're, they're often preferred. Um, my recommendation when you're doing your compiler lab is probably to use a parser generator. Um, okay, so um, as I mentioned to you, um, this course doesn't follow textbooks very closely, but it's well worth digging up a textbook and checking it out and I recommend that you do so sooner rather than later and all of the chat all of the textbooks begin with um, some of the topics that we're covering in this lecture so what I thought I would do next and basically to wrap up this 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 um, lecture is a complete 
but simple compiler from beginning to end. Um, I promised at the beginning that it would be so simple that it would fit onto a very small number of slides. In fact, I'm going to reduce the font. I'm going to fit it onto one slide. Of course, in order to do that, we're going to use a very powerful programming language, but also we're going to compile a very simple language to a very simple machine's instruction set. So the input is going to be a sequence of a string of characters representing an arithmetic expression. The output is going to be a sequence of instructions for a computer. And for the time being, it's going to be a really, really simple computer. And as the course goes on, we'll look at more sophisticated and more realistic instruction sets. And the key idea of a compiler is this, of course. What we're going to do is we're going to compile a input program, generate instructions, and evaluation of the expression doesn't actually happen until those instructions are executed. Right, so this is the big idea in a compiler. The compiler does its work, generates instructions, without needing to know what the program's input is going to be. Once you've got the instructions that the compiler is generating, that has generated, you can run that program again and again and again on different inputs. Okay, so um, let's do it. Let's build a top-down parser in Haskell for our simple little language. Here's my the grammar of the simple language. It's got a plus operator. Um, it's got expressions, which can be factors plus factors plus factors. And the factor is either a constant number or an identifier, the name of some variable that might, vary, that might be different each time we run the program. So um, <clears throat> the input to our compiler is going to be a character string like this. The lexical analysis is going to convert that character string into a sequence of lexical tokens. So we're going to represent that in Haskell by a data structure like this one, where the lexical analysis has told us that this begins with an identifier, which is A, then there's a plus symbol, then there's another identifier, which is B, and then there's a plus symbol, and then there's a numerical constant, which is 1. Okay. So this thing is just a list, right, of these items. The parse tree, the syntax analysis, constructs the parse or the parse tree for this input is, um, according to our grammar, I think you'll agree with me that this is, this is valid. And what the parser does, having proven that the input is syntactically correct, returns the abstract syntax tree, this, so remember the abstract syntax tree is a bit simpler than the parse tree. The abstract syntax tree, and this thing looks a little bit like that, but it's different because this is a tree, right? This tree tells us what the nesting structure of this expression is, right? So that's our job. Um, and this is the difference, incidentally, between the parse tree and the abstract syntax tree. Um, let's define some Haskell data types to make this work. Um, this is the data type for the lexical tokens. So they can either be identifiers, numerical constants, or a plus operator. And if it's an identifier, then this tells you what the actual name of that identifier is. And if it's a numerical constant, this tells you what actual numerical value it has. The abstract syntax tree um, is either an identifier or a number, or it's a plus operator with two sub-expressions, left and right. So just to be clear here, these, things, these two definitions look a bit similar, but they're different because this has a recursion here using the AST type. So this is a tree whilst this is just a token. So the first thing that we need 
is a function to um, convert character strings to lists of tokens. Actually, that isn't a hard problem. I am completely confident that you could write this code and I'll show you the code to do it later on. But let's not get bogged down in that for a minute. The fun one is the parser. So the parser takes the output from this, the list of tokens, and produces as its output the abstract syntax tree. And if it finds that it can't for some reason, there's a syntax error, then hopefully it will tell you what it was expecting and therefore what you might do to fix it. So the idea of recursive descent. So recursive descent is a strategy for implementing a top-down parser in a in 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 a, in a program and um, the basic principle is this look at the grammar and for each of the non-terminals in the grammar we're going to have a parse function so here's our grammar again and here are the two parse functions that we going we need one for this non-terminal and one for this non-terminal and the job of a parse function is to look at the next token and choose the right production and then eventually to return um, the abstract syntax tree for the sequence of tokens that corresponds to the non-terminal that it's been looking for. So, um, and because we're doing this in Haskell, what we're going to actually do is explicitly take the input list of tokens and return the remaining tokens that we haven't consumed yet. So the job of parseExp is to take as input a list of tokens and find to pick off enough tokens to form a syntactically valid expression, return the abstract syntax tree for that expression and return the remaining tokens that haven't been consumed yet. Okay? And the parse factor works similarly. So let's do the simplest case first. The simple one is this one, factor, right? So parse factor, um, there are basically two things that could happen. Either it's a number or an identifier. So we're going to define parse factor by pattern matching. If the first token is a number, then this pattern applies. And if the first token is an identifier, this pattern applies. If the first token is a number, then the abstract syntax tree for that thing is very, very easy to construct. It's just the num. It's, it's exactly corresponding, actually, to, 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 the, um, to the num case. And the remaining input is, well, whatever tokens were here are the remaining input. You might remember in Haskell pattern matching, um, this colon operator says that there's an element attached to the front of a list. And the first element of that list is here, and the remainder of the list is here. And what we're doing is we're defining this function by pattern matching. So if the input is consistent with that pattern, then this rule is the one that applies. The um, pattern matching is a nice way to write Haskell programs, and it's one of the reasons people like Haskell, um, and we'll use it later on. But for this particular purpose, it's sometimes actually more simple to use a different syntax in Haskell. And I wonder if you've seen it before. Um, what we're going to do is write exactly the same code as we had before, right? That we defined with pattern matching here. I'm just defining the same code in exactly the same way. What we're going to do is we're going to pattern match on the input list and give a name to the first token and a name to the remaining list of tokens. And then this case construct looks at the first token and checks, does it match this pattern, or does it match that pattern, or does it match neither of them? If it matches this one, then this is what we return. If it matches that one, this is what we return. 
And if it matches in neither, then we can produce a helpful error message saying what we expected. <clears throat> so um, the interesting case, that was the factor case, right? But that was the less interesting case. The more interesting case is this recursive case. So pars x, its job is to um, see whether the tokens that form the, that it's given begin with tokens that form a complete expression in this language. Now, looking at the grammar, we can see that whatever happens, it begins with a factor, right? And then what happens next depends upon what we see next. So let's use pars factor because we've just written it. Um, and what pars factor is going to do is it's going to look at the input and it's going to consume the factor that it sees and return the abstract syntax tree. So this thing is the, is the um, abstract syntax tree of the factor that it finds. And this is the remaining list of tokens after that factor has been taken off. So the next step shown here is do we see a plus next or not? Right, so let's look at this. We're going to look at the remaining input that we got from here and check, does it match this? Or if it doesn't match this, we're going to take this choice instead. If it does match this, then we are expecting um, an exp next, right? So what do we do? What we need is to find the expression that comes next and check that it's syntactically valid. And when we've done so, we want to get the abstract syntax tree for that expression that we found, combine it with the abstract syntax tree of the factor that we found over here, and return the abstract syntax tree for the plus node that we have now discovered. And when we do so, we want to return the remaining input after this sub-expression has been um, consumed. Okay, so this is a gap that I've left for you to fill in. What goes there? Well, what do we need? What we need is a function that consumes an expression, returns the tree, and returns the remaining input. That should sound familiar. That is exactly what parseExp itself is supposed to do. So what we need is to make a recursive call to the parseExp function, the exp parse function at this point. Right? It's going to take as input the remaining tokens after the plus sign. It's going to return as its result the remaining tokens after that expression has been consumed. And it's going to return the tree so that we can combine that tree with that tree to create a new node in the parse tree that we're going to return. Okay? And of course, if we don't see a plus here, then presumably we can be sure, therefore, that we should choose this production instead and we just return the fact tree that we found and the remaining tokens after it. Okay. So, um, one of the things you might notice from this is that the parseX function is recursive and the recursion in the function comes from, mirrors, the recursion in the grammar. Right? So the grammar defines the exp in terms of exp and the parse function for exp calls parse exp itself. So as we construct a more and more complex grammar, we end up with a parser whose implementation has a recursion structure that precisely matches the recursion in the grammar. <clears throat>
So we can put all of that together and um, the start symbol, remember, is exp. So we're going to call parse exp on the input token, get the tree back, and hopefully, if we've done this right, the remaining input will be empty, right? Because the, own, the input consists of just one exp. So we can check that and return a useful error, error message if that's not true. OK, we've done the hard bit, actually. I've shown you recursive descent parsing, top-down parsing for this simple grammar. And now we can do code generation. So we've constructed the abstract syntax tree. What we need to do now is to walk the tree. Now, the instructions that we've got are instructions for a stack machine. The um, idea of a stack machine is that it doesn't have any registers, but it does have a stack. And what, a, what the instructions can do is either push a constant onto the stack, push the value, the current value of a named variable onto the stack, or it can do an arithmetic operation like add, combining the top two items on the stack together with an add and pushing that back onto the stack. OK. <clears throat> so um, what we need to do is to walk the abstract syntax tree that we created and translate it into a list of instructions. So the translate function takes as input a tree, as output it gives us the list of instructions, and the idea is that we're going to give that to the machine, and it's going to execute that list of instructions and evaluate our expression. Um, but it's going to evaluate the expression using the current values of the named variables at the point at which we execute that program. So let's do the base case. So the, the right, so the point of this is that um, what we want to do is generate code which, when executed, evaluates the specified expression and leaves the value of that expression on the top of the stack. So there's a sense of a contract here. We have a contract that the um, compiler is going to give us code to evaluate the expression and that, that code can push things onto the stack. It might pop some things off the stack. But when it's finished, it's going to leave the current value, the, the computed value, on the top of the stack. And actually, um, there is a, there's a, one more constraint, which we'll come to in a bit. Um, when, we, the, when we have a, the stack pointer at a particular position, we can push things on. We can pop things off, but we mustn't pop more things off than the stack point than the position of the stack pointer at the point when we started, right? So the base case is easy. If we're asked to evaluate the constant three, then all we need is one instruction that pushes the constant three onto the stack, and we're done. We've satisfied the contract. If it's an identifier, um, perhaps A or something, then um, we generate an instruction that finds the current value of A and pushes that number onto the stack. And then we're done, right? We've satisfied the contract. The interesting case, the recursive case, is where we have two sub-expressions, E1 and E2, and we're supposed to add them together. So um, what we're going to have to do is have faith that the translate function can evaluate E1 and give us a sequence of instructions that fulfills our contract. So the contract was that this sequence of instructions that translate is going to give us leaves the value of E1 on the top of the stack. We can do it again with E2. Right, And the point is that this is supposed to generate code that pushes the value onto the stack so that now, when we execute this sequence, we'll have two values on the top of the stack at uh, this point. And we can use an add instruction to add those two values together to produce the result we want in the right place. 
okay? So that's it, basically. Um, the important thing to notice is how we are generating code. We're generating code by constructing a list of instructions as output. We're doing it by calling a function here that returns a list of instructions and then using the plus plus operator to join that list to the list returned by this and to join that to this list. The square brackets here say that this is a list containing just one instruction. Okay. So let's walk through an example of that. Um, here's our input 10 plus 5 minus a. We're going to apply the scan, the lexical analyzer, to produce the sequence of tokens, right? I hope you agree that that's the right sequence of tokens. Then we apply the parser on that input, right? And we get the abstract syntax tree. I hope you agree that that's the correct abstract syntax tree. Then we apply the a translate function that we've just seen. And what that's going to do is use that pattern matching to, um, to um, turn that tree, this tree here, into this sequence of instructions. Okay, so if we look back at this translator here, we're using pattern matching when the input expression looks like this we're going to use this product this right hand side this this um, implementation of translate so when we look at this tree it's a tree consisting of a sub expression and another more complicated sub expression the first sub expression ends up as a push a constant 10 onto the stack the second sub expression ends up as a sequence which results in this expression's value being on the top of the stack so that 10 and that value are ready for the add operator let's just see that um, um, shown in more detail to show how Haskell works um, so Haskell works by rewriting at each step we take the term that we've been given and we can select a subterm and rewrite it using one of the lines from the code from from the from the from the Haskell code so this is translate applied to a complicated input that begins with plus so um, it's going to match pattern matching we're going to pick this this case um, and what we're going to get is an instance of this, which is translate whatever E1 was, which was this thing, and translate whatever E2 was, which was this thing. So here it is. And then an add instruction. So as I was saying, what we're doing is we're constructing a list of instructions here. In this case, it's going to be just one instruction, push 10. And that's going to when we execute it push 10 on the stack now we're generating another list of instructions and when we elaborate that we get a sequence of instructions that push 5 push a subtracts those leaves the top of the expression at the top of the stack so that it's ready for the add okay so um that was actually the most that, that was the end point, really, for, for, for this. The translated the code generation part. Um, lexical analysis is code that I told you I believed you could write by hand. So let's not go through this in detail here. I'm going to skip over these slides and take you straight to this slide where I put it all together. So here is the lexical analysis stuff that I just this minute skipped over, but I'm sure you could figure it out. Here is the parsing stuff that we spent so much time on. And here is the code generation, which was actually the shortest and simplest part of the whole thing. And here is our complete compiler, right? So it calls the scanner, it calls the parser. There it is, remember this. Um, calls the translator and generates 
as output a list of instructions. Okay. So that brings us to the end of this introductory lecture. Um, and I have, as I promised, shown you a complete compiler from beginning to end in one lecture on one slide. Um, but it was super simple. What we're going to do next is look at more complicated programming languages, well, in particular, languages with assignment statements and for loops and while loops and if-then-else and things like that. And we're going to look at generating code for a more interesting and realistic processor architecture. In particular, we're going to look at generating code for machines that require that, that, that have registers. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Look forward to seeing you next time.